Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Liz Bates, standing in for Coco Khan. This week, who is the real Keir Starmer? I'll speak to journalist Tom Baldwin about the book that's got Westminster talking, the revealing biography of the Labour leader. Plus, why this week's Rochdale by-election is the most divisive in living memory. And does the Conservative Party have an Islamophobia problem? Yes. <laughs> well, that's that section done then. <laughs> Nish, you're in LA. Your instinctive broadcast journalism training just came out there without you being able to think about it. You jumped straight to the quick, Nish, you're in LA and how is the mood? <laughs> um, I yeah. am in Los Angeles. Live from LA, it's Nish. What can you see there on the ground? <laughs> I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and I am buried deep within the mothership. I'm at Crooked HQ um, and uh, it's very nice and uh, it's... It's very clean. It says here, Nish, can you remind listeners, Liz is a political correspondent for Sky News. Go on. <laughs> yes, that's right. Read your script, Nish. <laughs> I feel like a disgraced politician. I've been cross-examined <laughs> by a journalist. This is this is absolutely brutal. I've got Answer new sympathy question. for them. Yes, uh, Liz is joining us again. Uh, Coco is uh, again uh, off this week, but she will be back uh, next week. Liz Bates is, of course, a uh, political correspondent from Sky News and is going to be interviewing uh, Tom Baldwin uh, about his Keir Starmer book. And um, it's we're very happy that you've joined us, Liz. Two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. It's not... Uh, a coup, I promise. I will leave. Uh, I'm not just kind of waiting here permanently to be on the podcast. You will get Coco back. Um, tell us about LA, though, because I hear that there's some sort of passport shenanigans okay. that have gone on with you. What's ha- Are you stateless, is the question. <laughs> I'm like Tom Hanks in the terminal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. le- let's be clear here, Liz. Here's what's happened. The first day I arrived in New York... I left my passport in the taxi no. and it was not an Uber. It was a New York yellow cab. And I phoned up my girlfriend and the first thing she said was, don't talk about this because if your mum finds out, she'll kill you. And now, as I'm <laughs> telling you this now, the the problem is I discussed it on Love It or Leave It, which was uh, the show that I did on Thursday with John Love. John Love is a has a way of extracting information from people clearly that they do not want to give. Um, and what so, did yeah, he, I, did, what did he say that got that? Was he just like, "How are oh, you?" Oh, he just said, and "How you are you?" Like, yeah. I'm not really allowed to say this, <laughs> but I've left my passport in a taxi. My girlfriend's going to kill me. My mother's going to kill me. Is that what happened? So here's what happened. I left it in the taxi. I realised I left it in the taxi as soon as I got out of the taxi, but unfortunately the taxi had pulled away. I had a complete meltdown, as you would, as one would imagine. Um, and uh, it because not only did I lose my passport, it also had my American visa. So not only did I not have a passport, I did not have the paperwork that had allowed me to get into America. This actually gives me anxiety. Yeah. This is genuinely making me feel stressed. It was so stressful. Let me tell you, though, it does have a happy ending because I walked out of the uh, place that I was staying the next day and the taxi driver had waited overnight with my passport. Yeah. Yeah. He, he'd actually got back to where he lived in Jersey and driven back into Manhattan and was waiting for me with my passport. It was an unbelievable act of, of generosity. That is, um, that is heroic. Absolutely, he's my guy. hero of the week. 100% he's my hero of the week. Shout we out to, to... Do you know his name? Yeah, his name's Prince. I actually do know his name. <laughs> I'm not sure I should reveal it on the podcast. His name's Prince. He is hero of the week and villain of the week is my own incompetence. Um, but he... <laughs> But I, uh, the other thing that I revealed was I, I felt I, I was so stressed out by what he had had to go through that I actually gave him a thousand American dollars, and because oh, I felt so, because I felt I was so. Say, did you give him money? But that's yeah. like a lot of money. He'd, well, he'd also incurred some parking tickets. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> part of it was paying those off. But I then uh, a, a, a stand-up club in New York revealed this entire story and then someone asked the amount and I said a thousand dollars and it sort of engendered I would say like an atmosphere of suspicion uh, in the room because people were very confused by it that then made me defensive which led me to say oh I'm actually quite famous in Britain Um, (laughs) I just panicked I just panicked and then uh, and then a lady sat in the front row said I'm from Britain and I've never heard of you 
So <laughs> all round, all round, it was another fantastic. It was another fantastic Nish Kumar yeah, shit that show. Whole, that's a that's a very humbling experience that comes out quite well, and um, and Prince. A, a prince among men. Well, look, if you want to hear more about my uh, American-based uh, shenanigans, you can do uh, because I was a guest on uh, Love It or Leave It, uh, which is hosted uh, by John Lovett. It's Crooked's live variety show that's part comedy, part politics and recorded live on stage in front of a real audience. To watch, head to the Love It or Leave It YouTube channel. New episodes drop every Saturday only in the Love It or Leave It feed. By the time this podcast comes out, there'll be just a few hours for people in Rochdale, Greater Manchester to go to the polls in the latest Westminster by-election. How many of them turn out remains to be seen because the choices that have been put in front of them aren't exactly inspiring. Liz, please remind us of the absolute suicide squad rogues gallery vying to represent the lucky people of Rochdale. Okay, so deep breath. We've got, first of all, Azar Ali, suspended by the Labour Party for spreading conspiracy theories about Israel. Another former Labour MP, Simon Danchuk, was previously sacked for sending sexually explicit messages to a 17-year-old girl. Another candidate, Guy Otten, has been disowned by the Greens for making derogatory comments about Islam. And then for the Conservatives, well, they seem to have given up already. Their candidate went abroad on holiday last week instead of campaigning. Then you've got the former Labour MP, veteran agitator, George Galloway, who's, some would say opportunistically, looking to tap into the anger that some of the town's Muslim voters feel over Gaza. Liz, uh, you've covered uh, many by-elections uh, in your time. Is this sure have. the most uninspiring lineup in your experience? Well, there's a lot going on in that lineup. It's a sort of, uh, what is it? It's kind of the... the the wreckage of uh, the Labour Party, if you like, Ver- you know, various sort of bits of a car in flames. None yeah. of those people are are, la- are Labour candidates in a in a seat that is a, a safe Labour seat. And I should say, Tony Lloyd, the Labour MP that that died, and that's the re- that's the reason the by election uh, ended up taking place, is a lovely was a lovely man. Yeah. So it's a bit of a shame that this is all kind of you know uh, happening so soon after he died and is not in any way a a, a legacy that reflects on his service of the constituency at all. Azar Ali was the Labour candidate and eventually they pulled their support for him, but he's still in the running. Too late. And he's still on the ballot paper. We should say he's still still on the ballot ballot paper as the Labour candidate. candidate. Yeah, because it was all just far too late. Labour then couldn't uh, put their own candidate forward. So there's still a possibility that he might win. Now, George Galloway, what to say? Um, well, yeah, to contextualise him, him, just in case there are listeners who don't know, he, he was expelled uh, as a Labour MP in 2003 over Iraq and he sort of became a kind of firebrand speaker at the time. It, you know, he was... But he then sort of has now been doing shows on Iran's press TV and Russia Today. He made an infamous appearance on Celebrity Big Brother where he pretended to be a cat. And, he, he you know... He, he, and that was the he best then, thing he's ever done, I think. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And he did actually uh, campaign in the by-election in Batley and Spen in 2021. You actually followed that by-election yeah. quite closely, right, Liz? Well, and you I was actually covering got to that see by-election. The best way to describe a by-election with George Galloway in it is, like, you've walked into a room where two people ha- are, have, like, just had a blazing argument and you kind of walk in there and you're like, what is the... What's going on with the atmosphere here? Why is why is it so tense? Like, wh- wh- what have you said to each other? <laughs> That's what it's like. It's just it's so, the atmosphere is so tense because his way of kind of you have to get attention for yourself if you're going to take on Labour and the Tories and the Lib Dems because of our political system. You, you know, you have to make a lot of noise, and his politics is is very divisive. It's very kind of attacking of Labour, telling Muslim voters that they've been totally sold out, and bring you know kind of whipping up anger about international conflicts and previously it was Iraq and now uh, it's on Gaza. In Batley and Spen, he came really close and Batley and Spen was where Joe Cox was murdered. Yeah. Her sister was standing um, and you can imagine how difficult that was for the family and, and then there was all this, you know, hatred being whipped up by George Galloway and I was working for Channel 4 News at the time so we went on a, on the battle bus with him and the the whole interview was very tense because I was kind of saying to him, like, look, you know, this campaign, there's been a lot of complaints. People say you're intimidating. He seemed to be constantly flanked by, like, not people that would normally be involved in politics. They looked like, you know, bouncers almost. It's like yeah. young lads in, like, 
in sunglasses and they were always getting in and out of like Range Rovers with blacked out windows and stuff. It was a really bizarre campaign. And I kind of said that to him. Um, and eventually he was just like, this interview's over, get off my bus. Right. So then he just dumped me on the side of the street with my <laughs> cameraman and we were like, what just happened? <laughs> um, yeah, so it just, it wasn't a... It wasn't a, a, a glittering moment for my <laughs> journalistic career. And uh, yeah, he, he lost that, but like very marginally. And I think there's definitely the possibility that um, he, he could win in Rochdale. But he's uh, it will be very difficult for the Labour Party and Keir Starmer if he ends up with a national platform in Parliament. We should also mention uh, the other story that dominated uh, at the start of the week. And it's not a story that's going to um, improve either of our moods, Liz. Um, the row over Islamophobia in the Conservative Party, um, it may well have ended the Tory party career of a familiar character to us on this podcast, the anti-woke crusader and MP for Ashfield, Lee Anderson, a man who has made a career out of alternating between hypocrisy and stupidity. He's famously known as 30p Lee for the time he suggested that people could cook themselves meals from scratch for about 30 pence a day. I think... He's become something of a of a caricature of yeah. himself. The things that he says, I think, are sometimes done to for the shock value. I think Rishi Sunak brought him in and made him deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. He they may be not naturally uh, the type of people that would usually work together or even meet each other. But I think his role in Rishi Sunak's mind was that he would appeal to those kind of 2019 Brexit Tory voters that came along under Boris Johnson that the Conservatives have all but lost, uh, you know, going to the next general election. And I think the the feeling number 10 was, you know, maybe we can just let Lee Anderson kind of sit on the side here and say some, you know, uh, pretty inflammatory things and we'll just keep a distance from it and hope that some voters think, oh, well, they the Conservative Party still gets me. He has a show on GB News, a channel which pays him £100,000 a year, um, separate to his ministerial salary. Um, and he was suspended by the Conservative Party for saying this about London Mayor Sadiq Khan. We've got a very cowardly Khan uh, running London. He's uh, He seems to be letting the uh, not only the Jewish population down, but the old population of London and Britain as a whole. And I heard the comments here, I heard the comments earlier you was making about Suella, some of the comments she made earlier this week. And I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country, but what I do believe is they've got control of Khan and they've got control of London and they've got control of Storm as well. Um, Anderson insisted that his comments weren't racist at all and added that he would not apologise to Khan while I have a breath in my body. Rishi Sunak said the comments were wrong and unacceptable, but he avoided directly answering whether the comments were Islamophobic. And he declared that he is living proof that Britain uh, is not a racist country. There's a lot to sort of unpack here. On the one hand, Rishi Sunak is an Asian man who's become prime minister. He is the first person of colour to hold that office but at the same time he wasn't elected by the public and when he was put in front of a section of the electorate that weren't Conservative MPs i.e. the membership of the Conservative Party he lost to Liz Truss um, and I mean t some of the polling uh, that's come out today that's commissioned by Hope Not Hate uh, has shown that more than half of Conservative Party members believe Islam is a threat to the British way of life and it also found that 52% believe the increasingly prominent conspiracy theory that parts of European cities are under Sharia law and are no-go areas for non-Muslims. And I, well, I think you know, this is I, the that's the problem, isn't it? It's parroting, it, it's using the language that that has come from these kind of conspiracy theories that are online. So the idea that you know Sadiq Khan is under the control of Islamists is very conspiratorial language and it's the yeah. same thing that, that it was Paul Scully um, a Conservative MP who said that there are no-go zones in Birmingham and London and that's the kind of thing that you that that online takes on a whole different flavour and it's a, and it's pretty unpleasant stuff it made me think though Nisha I don't know I mean do you, are there any no-go zones in London for you you live in London I personally never go into like a Gales bakery because I just <laughs> find it too middle class it's just very like i find it quite hostile as a northerner because yeah. the the pastries are so um you know expensive and the sandwiches are so small it's such a strange and specific conspiracy theory but it is one that has 
very, very real consequences. You know, Sadiq Khan is one of the most protected politicians in the country. And there is a reason for that. He's one of the most prominent British Muslim politicians. You know, those two things are uh, not unrelated. And look, uh, uh, coming on top of a week where... Liz Truss has uh, appeared with some incredibly unsavoury characters um, at CPAC and also continued to indulge um, and encourage conspiracy theories in the speech that she gave to the Conservative Political Conference. And Suella Braverman wrote an article in The Telegraph saying that Britain was in the hands of Islamists on top of the Anderson comment and the Scully comment. Uh, Look, it is my personal view that there is a hierarchy of racism in Britain. If someone in the Labour Party is racist then that is an extremely serious matter that deserves constant and relentless scrutiny. If somebody in the Conservative Party or Conservative adjacent is racist, then everyone just needs to grow up and stop being snowflakes. Conservative racism in this country is not taken seriously enough. That is what, as a cultural phenomenon, allows Boris Johnson's electoral victory after he had used strings of racist language in newspaper columns that are still available. The Conservative Party has a racism problem and we have no mechanism to scrutinise it. Apart from this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man, if this podcast is the sole method of scrutiny, then we really are more fucked than I thought we are. (laughs) We should say uh, on a brighter note that um, Sadiq Khan still has a substantial 25-point lead uh, ahead of his Conservative rival, Susan Hall, in the London mail race, according to a YouGov poll. So uh, I think he's going to win. Yeah. (laughs) That would be my prediction. (laughs) (laughs) It's a gift, Nish. I just, you know, I'm an expert, so I just... You know what? Take it it's from that me. kind of ex- is that that kind of expertise that we bring you on the podcast for list. You're really going to miss it next week. <laughs> Coming up next, and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing this. An interview Liz recorded earlier with Tom Baldwin, author of the big political book of the moment, a revealing new biography of Keir Starmer that's been making a big splash in the papers. <laughs> So, with a general election just a matter of months away and Labour streets ahead in the polls, all the signs point to Keir Starmer potentially becoming the 58th Prime Minister by the end of the year. So, it's the perfect time for a biography of the Labour leader which paints the fullest picture we've had yet of the man who's taken his party from its worst election result in 84 years to the brink of returning to power. Keir Starmer, the biography, hits the shelves on the day we release this podcast. Its serialisation in The Times means it's already been making waves, with one reviewer calling it the most important book of the year. It was written by the journalist and former spin doctor to Ed Miliband, Tom Baldwin. Hello, Hello. Tom. So first of all, how does it feel to have written the most important book of the year? I hope it's important because I think Keir Starmer is going to be important. I think this election is important. And if the polls are right and Keir Starmer is going to be Prime Minister, he's going to be going to Downing Street still, I think, with quite a lot of unanswered questions about him. Um, What this book tries to do is take what's been a rather sort of two-dimensional character, sometimes rather misunderstood, sometimes too easily caricatured, and fill that person in to show the three-dimensional side to him. And, you know, I'm very clear about this is not an authorised biography. This is what I hope is an authoritative biography. It's been written with his cooperation, lots of interviews with his family, his friends, his closest advisors. But he doesn't like every word. He won't like every word when he finishes the book. So tell us about that process a little bit, because it started off as a memoir, you were writing it, together with him he gave you full access and then it it became a biography and as you say an unauthorized biography so tell us about that process and how that all happened back in what 2022 when there's this great big slab of conventional wisdom which said that someone like Keir Starmer could never beat the charismatic Boris Johnson and Labour were set for at least 10 years in opposition People around Keir Starmer were saying, we've somehow got to get your message over, we've got to get your personality over. And so I was brought in to try and help him put this autobiography together. It became pretty clear pretty quickly he was uncomfortable with it. And it's quite Starmer-ish that 
he doesn't like the idea of 300 pages of him talking about himself. He's never really liked talking about himself. And I think that's part of the key to him, why he's a rather untypical politician. Most politicians love nothing more than talking about themselves. He doesn't. He's come into politics quite late. He doesn't see the, why it's necessary to talk about his mum and dad all the time or where he grew up or his feelings. That doesn't affect how he's going to be prime minister, he says. So a lot of this process has been sort of chiselling out. So it was a bit like pulling teeth. Because I remember when I was working at Channel 4 News, I did one of the first uh, sit-down interviews with him. I said, tell me about your your motivation, your background. What is it that gets you out of bed every day? What is it that uh, inspires you? And what's the reason that you came into politics thinking? I was just opening the door for him to say, well, this is what my upbringing was like and these are my values and this is what I really care about. And he was so so closed off Mm. and I asked him the question in like five or six different ways and I remember sitting across from him thinking god I don't know if I can use any of this for this for this piece that I'm trying to put on the news because it's so boring he just wouldn't talk about himself personally so how did you get him to that point where he could because he really he opens up a lot in this book some really personal stuff some really emotional stuff about his parents how did you get him to that point time getting to know him persuading him that this these stories, which are still pretty raw to him, I mean, stuff about his dad and not really knowing that his dad loved him until after his dad died and he was cleaning out his cupboard and found a scrapbook which his dad had hidden of all the, his kids' achievements in his life. Um, getting a letter from someone in the village saying that when they went round Rodney Starmer's house, mm. when Keir became an MP, he had the Parliament Channel on in a hope of catching a glimpse of his son Keir never knew that. He, Dad never said, apart from once in his life, that he was proud of him. And so it was all too late. And so, and that was after he died. And mm, Keir says in the book as well that he, he just felt that he couldn't even hug him they as, they as he was dying. Years. There was they never that 20, moment where they said how they felt. So this is something that he found out afterwards. Yeah. I'm interested in you saying he doesn't like every word. What does he think about the book? Um, he's reading it now. Um, I did show him bits and pieces of it while I was writing it to check my facts, but not to check my interpretation. Um, what he said to me, I don't know whether I should disclose, but I, I will. He said that he's learned a few things about himself. He's worked out a bit more of who he is and how he fits in with the rest of the world and how other people see him sometimes. He can be a bit relentless. Uh you know, one of his ex-girlfriends, Philippa Kaufman, has quoted in a book saying, you know, he, he just keeps going, he keeps going. That's pretty tough sometimes to be around. And I'm not sure he always realised that. Mm. That, um, I think, you know, one of the things that people have really picked up on in the book is that relationship with his parents. His mother was very ill. He's talked about it a little bit before, but we've, we find out so much more about it and particularly that difficult relationship with his dad. That moment that you just described where he found the cuttings. Actually, makes me feel a bit emotional <laughs> now. <laughs> and realised that he'd, his dad had been <laughs> um, watching him in the House of Commons hoping to catch a glimpse of him. It, it's so small and yet so huge, so so poignant. I'm not surprised that people have picked it out because that difficult, especially for people of his generation, that difficult relationship with your parents, things left unsaid and having those tiny little moments, they couldn't, he couldn't tell his son that he was proud of him mm. or that he loved him. And then he suddenly finds out after he's died. How did you feel when you, when you kind of heard that from him? I think... Um... To be honest, we both slightly welled up a bit. There's this, there's something about the scrapbook being hidden. Yeah. It's not like this is, you know, but a family album and everyone comes around and gets to look at it. It was hidden at the back of a cupboard and he only found it when he's cleaning out the house. And there's something, I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, this is not exceptional. With notes on it that his dad had yeah, written. Yeah, I mean, he knew his dad because his dad had, you know, his dad was a craftsman and he had this very neat handwriting and he'd put all the photographs in very, very neatly. And he knew that was his dad, it was absolute dad's, hallmark. I think it speaks to quite a lot of people's relationships with their dads, particularly of that generation. I think, you know, we are quite a buttoned up country. Why do you think it's taken him 
until now to start kind of, you know, talking about his backstory and revealing who he is. You mentioned him being British. You, you in the book, there's a, a conversation with Obama, uh, mm. I think, and certainly the Americans are better at talking about themselves. I mean, Obama is the absolute king of, you know, telling stories and give, getting that meaning and narrative and, and weaving it into politics. And do you think that was a, an important moment? Yeah, I think it was part of the process. Obama is this amazing storyteller. I mean, I covered, when I was a journalist for The Times, I covered that Obama election. I was working in Washington between 2005 and 2009, so I followed Obama around. And his first memoir, Dreams of My Father, tells of a very difficult relationship with a sometimes distant father. And so Keir Starmer and Obama were having these Zoom conversations organised by David Lammy, who knew Obama when he was at Harvard. Um, and Keir was talking a little bit about his background and Obama was pulling these stories out of him, probably a bit like I was trying to do with Keir as well. And Obama said, when you said your father wasn't respected, that's your story. That's your political story. Because there's, there's been a lack of respect for people, ordinary people in this country. And sure enough, you know, a couple of months after those calls, you know, I think there were a couple of calls, he did a speech about respect for the first time. But it's, kid still doesn't really like the idea of harnessing his family and his background into a great arc of political narrative because it's messy. Real life is messy. Real people are complicated. Obama, when he was doing the dreams of my father, he was telling a story about his African-American roots because at that stage in Obama's career, he wanted to get selected for a congressional seat in Chicago, which was very heavily African-American. And so Obama was always sort of harnessed his story to his politics. Keir is still a bit reluctant. You know, he just, you know, he, he, he always uses the football metaphor. And he said, look, I want to do my talking on the pitch. I want to do rather than say. And his frustration with being leader of the opposition is, you know, he's now spent nine years in opposition. He thought he was going to come in and be a minister in Ed Miliband's government. Didn't work out. Um, and his frustration is, he, you know, he says, I haven't done anything yet. I spent nine years and I haven't achieved anything. I mean, some people say he achieved quite a lot and changed the Labour Party. In his view, he hasn't changed people's lives. And that genuinely, I think, is why he came into politics. Hmm. I suppose as well, when you start to talk about yourself and your family, you then uh, open the door for all of that being fair game. It's then talked about publicly. And especially if you put yourself on a pedestal, then you invite um, people to knock you off it. Uh, there's uh, something more than that. There's something more than that. He, he has these bridges back to his old life for his family, for his old friends, got a big network of very old friends. Football's very important to him. Friends, family, for three Fs. And in a way, he's sort of keen to keep those bridges open by not allowing politics to contaminate them almost. To, to, to. So, you know, he doesn't like, you know, if he, if he starts talking about his kids, I mean, he wants to protect his kids' identity, never names them. But if he starts talking about his kids, somehow that relationship with them becomes... Political. Public property. Not just public property, but it's almost you're tainting it, you know, with, by using these anecdotes. So he's got these rather standard anecdotes, which he repeats over and over again about his kids, because that's a safe place. And he's not really letting people see too much. He doesn't like to play football with other politicians and for the cameras because that's his safe place he goes with his old friends where he can be himself he likes to go to the pub with his friends I mean most times pub, you know a politician goes to a pub they go straight behind a bar and pull a pint for the cameras rather badly usually he slips into the background and so the more he makes these parts of his real life his old life part of his political brand the less power they actually have to keep refreshing him as a politician. So it's he's, he's stubbornly kind of refusing to let people in too much into that real world, which might be important politically, because he thinks he's actually trying to protect something about who he is and what he might do if he's prime minister. 
I've worked in in politics for a long time, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I always uh, think if you don't immediately define yourself, other people will step into that vacuum. I think you call it in the book, um, and define you. Now, Keir Starmer has been defined and was very early on as a a kind of member of the establishment, a knight, a, a, you know, the kind of North London liberal elite, a barrister. And I think that really cemented itself in, uh, in, in voters' minds quite quickly. Is it too late now for him to retell that story? Because that's not him at all. He is so not the establishment. I mean, when you read this book, his his uh, his childhood especially is very, it's not just working class. There's There's poverty and struggle and ill health you know there's a lot going on yeah and I, I think look, people are complicated and whenever I th- you see a political caricature it's almost always wrong um is it too late I don't know some of the reaction I've been getting to my book suggest to me it may not be uh a guy from the BBC said we're never going to be able to call him boring again after this He's not. I remember asking him in a press conference, uh, this was quite early days, standing up and saying, um, you know, are you too boring to be prime minister? And all these Labour members sitting around me going, boo, boo, boo. That was what people were saying at the time on the doorstep. You know, it wasn't me asking him if he's boring. Although I I do find him, you know, uh, quite, he's he's a real introvert, certainly around the press. You know, I've met him a few times and he's like, you know, he's not, he doesn't have a kind of uh, natural charm in the way that some politicians do he's he's not a typical politician um i think quite a lot of people if you suddenly put a camera on them would be stiffen up a bit as with everything that Keir Starmer does he learns and he works at it so i, I don't think he's the best conference speak, speaker but he's much much better than he once was i don't think he's the best ever performer at pmqs but he's much better than he once was He's much better at talking about his background than he once was. And there's a kind of perseverance and relentlessness about this guy, which is impressive. You know, if he sees something he's not good at, he will try very hard to get better at it, even though he says himself, I'm never going to make a conference speech like Neil Kinnock. I'm never going to be as brilliant at PMQs as William Hague. It's also worth pointing out, neither of those ever won a general election. And, you know, there's something about the unflashiness, which I think is quite important about him. So much of politics in recent years has been this grand spectacle and fireworks. I mean, and Tony Blair conjure up these visions of shining cities on a hill, which didn't always get beyond the artist's impression. And Boris Johnson would gather a huge crowd around him as he's created a bonfire of all the things that we valued most. And Starmer... He talks about building blocks. He's always going on about building blocks and the building blocks of his argument. He puts one on top of another. And no one's going to watch that much and it might even be a bit boring. But turn your back, come back, oh, he's built a house. And what's left of Johnson is a sort of smouldering wreck. Well, one of the things about this book, I mean, there's there's lots of kind of analysis and I think you do get a, 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 an incredible sense of of who he is. I mean, it's it's beautifully written and it's just a great story um as well but g- just give us a sense of some of the anecdotes because some, there's some quite funny anecdotes that build up a picture of who he is i mean he he was a kid at school that would kind of get into fights and at university he lived above a, a brothel well, that's after he left university but, oh, was it, yeah, was yeah, it but, after um, university yes you're right London, yeah. um and uh, the where thing he, that, of course where he then gave legal advice to some of the women working b- below stairs you know it's very, very but, you know, Starmer. <laughs> Classic yeah, Starmer. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that surprised me was the um, Northern Soul dancing, because that's such a big thing in in you know where I come from. And, and he uh, does that. I mean, I've not seen him. Does dance. he do it? He does. Because you have to dance. learn how to do it properly. There's I, like I know people who have seen the Leader Low Party dance, and he does that funny thing with his feet with and the, the feet and the, and the, and the arms. The flips, you and, yeah, can't yeah, lift whole, your arms up. The whole thing with the spins and the flips. He does that apparently. Yeah. Because we have a working men's club in the village that I come from, and if you lift your arms up a lot, then people will sort of <laughs> come over and be like, well, can you stop doing that? I'll just get off the dance floor. And people go and take changes of outfit, put talc on the floor. Anyway, this is not about me. <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of my 
most prized gets in the book is that there's this northern indie band from Leeds where Starmer was at university. Who's the band? The Sorry? Wedding Present. The Wedding Present. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry. And he, in this book that um, the Wedding Present have just produced of all these different fans from around the world, on something like page 242, suddenly there's a picture of Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, M-P-K-C-K-C-E, talking about his favourite track and how he knew them and, you know, one of them, you know, one of his friends lent a guitar to them when they were starting out and they never got it back. And, you know, like, and he does have a kind of, he does have a hinterland. Um, music is quite a big part of him. Football's an enormous part of him I and mean, almost to a point of dysfunction. I mean, the, one of his friends, Mark Adams, says, most politicians pretend to like football to appear more normal. If kids going to appear normal, he probably has to tone the football bit down a bit because it's a bit, bit obsessive. He's not obsessive. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when the Arsenal fixtures come out, he immediately goes to his diary secretary and goes, can we block that off, block that off, block that off? Now, whether he's going to be able to do that in Downing Street, I don't know. And that's part of the story. Of, you know, I mean, we've spoken a bit today about how he needs these bridges back to real life to feel that he, he's himself. Well, security's not going to let him sit in the stand in Arsenal. Security's not going to let him play eight-side football in Kentish Town. His kids are going to have to move to Downing Street, probably. I mean, with his daughter says so he's refusing to go. I mean, if he wins, and everything has to be an if. But so, so how he maintains that contact with the outside world and that those things which are very important to sort of reaffirm his sense of himself. I think is actually quite a big question as he gets further down the road towards Downing Street. There's lots of things that about him that ordinary people could identify with. The, you know, the love of football, the, you know, very quite a normal family, working class background, uh, and all these other things, interest in music. Um, and yet he still is not really connecting with a lot of voters who have a very similar life experience to him. Why do you think that is? Partly it's his reluctance. He just doesn't want to let people in. There's another side to him as well, which is he's not just this very ordinary bloke. He's a very, very high-achieving, high-striving, high-driving bloke. And he's... There is something... That's the thing. He's not just an ordinary guy. No. There's something different about he, him as well. They used to, I mean, his siblings used to call him Superboy. There's that aspect of him, root, like relentless, hardworking... And ruthless. Ruth, and ruthless. And that's the thing which I think makes him hard to gauge somehow. I mean, I had this conversation with him once about all these old friends and endless anecdotes of his decency and how he turns up when they're most in need and things like that. But you look at his leadership at Labour Party and he's ruthless as hell. I mean, yeah, I'll tell you one story. So when my old boss, Ed Miliband, stood in for Keir Starmer at very short notice because Starmer had got COVID, they stood in from at PMQs and he did really well. And the sketch writers, of course, went, oh, there's the passion that's been lacking. Why can't Keir Starmer be as passionate and as principled and exciting as that? You know, they never were that nice about Ed Miliband when he was leader, of course, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, but he did really well. And sometimes when your understudy does well, you, your nose might be a bit out of joint. No. Keir Starmer sent him messages. He wrote him a note. He even texted Justine, Ed's wife, to say, when Ed walks in the house, you make sure he knows how well he's done. And it was genuine. He knew it's cathartic for Ed. He'd had this horrible experience in 2015. But then a couple of months later, Keir Starmer strips Ed Miliband of the post of Shadow Business Secretary because that was what was necessary in his view at that time. And that juxtaposition of decency and really hard, ruthless, driving bastard sometimes is quite extraordinary. And it's that's real, I think, because I, I mean, that's what... That was his reputation um, when he became Labour leader, decency, integrity. He was mm -hmm. almost, you know, the antithesis in some ways of Boris Johnson, right? And then the the way that, I mean, you know, this is obviously a central 
a part of his story as a politician, getting rid of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, you know, there are, I mean, as you say in the book, there are different recollections of how that all happened. But I remember covering it as a journalist. Jeremy Corbyn found out that he'd been chucked out of the Labour Party by a, a cameraman mm-hmm. standing in the street. And I interviewed Keir Starmer quite soon after that. Um, and I was genuinely surprised at how uh, unsentimental he was. Whatever you think of Jeremy Corbyn, and you know, lots of people have lots of different opinions of Jeremy Corbyn. This is a man, a, a former leader, who's dedicated his life to the Labour Party. It's not happened since Ramsay MacDonald. Look, no leader has been had the whip taken away yeah. from him since like, Ramsay MacDonald. I mean, it, no conversation. Yeah. Like they, you right. know, he hadn't spoken to him. It's it's extraordinarily ruthless and almost like judicial. It's like you cross line out. The interesting thing is, even now, I've not found a single quote from Keir Starmer attacking Jeremy Corbyn's character or personality. In some way, actually, Corbyn doesn't attack Starmer. They're both rather sort of old-fashioned, don't believe in personality politics. And you'd have thought in circumstances like that, I mean, lots of the people around each of them say awful things about the other. But there's actually something rather old-fashioned and stiff. They don't attack each other personally. It's about this narrow dispute about whether Jeremy Corbyn broke this rule and so on. I mean, the only person I think Keir Starmer really hates in politics is Johnson. He, and he, you know, and that, he took a while to do that. He doesn't hate. He just acts in quite a cold, clear-eyed fashion. What do you think he hates about Boris Johnson? He's a bullshitter. And he's almost the opposite of Starmer. So it's interesting, both of them had quite successful careers before they became MPs. They're unusual politicians in that sense. Both of them have, therefore, an appeal and a breadth of experience outside narrow politics. But whereas Starmer is about rules and integrity and systems and trying to make things work. Johnson is all about entitled bullshit show. And he, I think Stum absolutely loves that kind of guy. You know, he, you know, he's pulled himself up through life, through hard work and achievement and facts. And Johnson's swanned in and I've been allowed to get away with things because he's got a sort of easy charm and can make some punny jokes. And they are chalk and cheese. I think maybe you hate Johnson as well, Tom. <laughs> well, I hate him. I, I hate him before anyone else did. I wrote a column for the Times, 2002, entitled Why I Hate Boris Johnson, which I thought <laughs> was prescient. You were in on the, on, you know, yeah, the, on no, the ground floor. I know. It's one of the, one, you one led the, the way. Things, one of the few things I wrote as a journalist which turned out that everyone else believed it eventually too. Tell me what you learned uh, during writing this book about Keir Starmer's politics, because that's something I think that people, uh, certainly voters, people in journalism, people in who work in Westminster, have struggled to identify what his politics mm. really is, because it it's changed during his leadership. He's made promises on various things that he's reversed. How, uh, if you can just give us a, a sense, first of all, how was it forged? I mean, he grew up under Thatcher. Yep. And in a very sort of Labour-supporting socialist house. I mean, he's called Keir for a reason. He's named after Labour's first leader, which is unusual in Surrey. He definitely doesn't have a, a sort of fixed ideology, and that's really important. He's not part of a faction. He doesn't have a bunch of Starmer rights around him. There may not be a sort of fixed Starmerism, but I do think he has values. I think they're recognisable values, but they're not codifiable. They're, you know, they're about a sort of everyday decency, uh, a desire to help people get on, a dislike of snobbery. I mean, it does have a green side. I mean, despite, you know, dropping this £28 billion spending pledge, I, I think the Green green Party has run through his career and his, and, his, and his life. He does have a very, very firm belief in 
in sort of international bodies, which I think is very important in terms of foreign policy. He, you know, the Human Rights Act is about an interdependent world. Uh, he also sees it as a vehicle for extending Britain's soft power. If you're looking for some rigid ideological apparatus or a label to pin on him, you won't get it. But I think you, it's not the same as just competence and technocracy. There are, there are values, but values are immutable. They're about feelings. He's a complicated person in the way that real people are complicated and politicians aren't allowed to be. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning as well that, you know, a, a lot of this book shows him in quite a positive light. But to fully understand someone, you have to speak to their critics, their enemies, as well as their friends. And you did that. Yeah, and I think it's absolutely fair to say that sometimes his critics have a point. You know, if I was one of those people on the left of the Labour Party who had voted for Keir Starmer as Labour leader because of the 10 pledges, I, I think you've got a good reason to feel fairly pissed off at the moment. I think he has made mistakes as Labour leader. You know, he misspoke at the end of the party conference in an interview on LBC about Israel-Gaza and he didn't correct it fast enough. He made a mistake, I think, quite recently on the Rochdale by-election in initially standing by the Labour candidate there before then quite ruthlessly getting rid of him. So, you know, this guy's not perfect. He's still, I think, learning how to be a politician. He's still... And like anybody, he will get things wrong. What's important, though, is how you react to making an error. Do you double down behind that error? Or do you actually sometimes say, yep, yeah, hands up, I've screwed up, I'm going to learn from that? The way that you describe his personal life uh, is quite nice. He's very domesticated. You know, uh, there's this... Uh, um, image of him kind of separating warring cats. <laughs> well, that's, that's when I went around his house just before Christmas last year, um, for one of the final interviews for the book. And he arrives in this great big cavalcade of security cars, like this, because three cars, and there's this rather sort of startled woman with her dog. And then he goes in the house, and it's freezing, because the boiler's broken. And he goes, oh, sorry, we've got the plumber coming around. So we're waiting for the plumber to come around and he's making tea for the plumber. And then he goes, go upstairs and show him what's wrong with the plumber. And the boiler's making quite a weird noise. And then his kids are coming back and his son's just done a mock English GCSE. And you know, he's talking about the Middle East peace process. He's talking about this. And then there's this terrible noise out in the garden. And he goes, oh, of course. And so he goes out and there's Jojo the cat who's got into a massive cat fight. And so... In the middle of this quite long interview, he's standing in the garden. Vic's just arrived and sort of, he's separating the cats. And then he comes back and he's got blood dripping down his hand from one of the cats. And he's got a bit of kitchen roll wrapped around it. And it's the sense of this quite ordinary blow, almost relishing this ordinariness still, this domesticity, as he's preparing for the final ascent on the summit. And he loves all that. He loves all that chaos. And there's this great bit at the end where I'm trying to still get to wherever there's a starmerism. And so I say, maybe it's this relationship with the state and more active interventionist state. He goes, yeah, there's a bit of that. And then he goes into an anecdote about something that Gordon Brown told him about how businesses have a different relationship with the society post-financial crash. And then he talks about his friend Colin Peacock, who he's meant to meet in a pineapple pub later, but he can't because he's busy. But Colin works for Procter & Gamble and understands about business too. And then he talks about Arsenal's community programme and they're a business and they're doing stuff in community. I go, so you've got a former prime minister, you'll make Colin down the pub and Arsenal explaining a new relationship with the state. That's very Starmer-ish, isn't it? Is there a Starmerism? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I just want to get things done. At which point, Vic, his wife, says, if you really want to get things done, Keir, could you order a takeaway because we haven't got any food? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, he is an ordinary bloke, yeah. but he's doing an extraordinary job. Tom, it's a beautifully written book, completely fascinating, very important that we get to know this man who might be Prime Minister possibly this year. And um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. 
We've had some lovely responses to our guest last week, uh, the unexpected political commentator, Will Young. Uh, Carolina has emailed from Cape Town to say, Will for PM, please get him back. Best guest ever. Harry has also emailed in and said, if Will Young wants to put up pictures of Jacob Rees-Mogg lying down on the Commons benches around Somerset, then I will rent us a van and drive. Um, And Alice Murray has commented on YouTube, Will is spot on about changing the Commons and Parliament in general to a modern purpose-built building. The whole thing is on the verge of falling down anyway and MPs have been dithering about getting it fixed for literal decades commissioning costly report after report effing re-smog and that's not me censoring Alice Alice has taken it upon themselves to censor the F word Um, I just didn't want anyone to think that I was I was intervening there. Um, Effing Reese Mogg wants any repairs to be done with MPs staying in the building throughout, which adds millions and years to the estimated cost. It's an appalling shambles. Um, Last week's episode with Will Young is definitely well worth a listen back if you missed it. He told us he's thinking about having a go at becoming an MP and you can find the episode in our feed. We've also had someone on TikTok writing in defending your villain last week, Nish, the anonymous writer of that sign in a hospital library banning smelly Indian food. At Petal585 says, I work in a library. The books really do absorb strong smells like spicy food, cigarette smoke, etc. It ruins the books. Well, you say it ruins the books. I say it adds texture. That's part of the reason that I like books rather than uh, e-books or reading them on an e-reader. I I like the fact that books absorb the memory of the places that they've been. Where is your sense of romance at Petal 585? Imagine, you know, flicking through a copy of Bleak House by Charles Dickens and getting the waft of a decade-old booner. That's the romance of literature. It absorbs, it remembers, and it passes that knowledge on. I think that's absolutely great. Um, you can get in touch with us uh, by emailing psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk. It's always nice to hear your voices. So do send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 644 Internationally, that's plus 447514 And don't forget to follow at Pod Save the UK on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. You can drop us a review too if you like. Liz, thank you so much uh, for joining me once again. And thank you so much pleasure. for having a chat with Tom. You've done a sterling job. A sterling job. I've enjoyed it very much. Well, and I've stopped talking. The end. That's the end of me. I've gone. <laughs> no more Liz Bates. <laughs> what it. a way to end the podcast. What a way to end it. Just on a high. That's it. I've just gone. Sort of no more out. Liz just... Bates. <laughs> yeah. Just started talking about myself in the third person (laughs) and then silence. I'll be back uh, um, on safer ground in the United Kingdom uh, next week uh, with Coco Khan in tow. Um, But uh, till then, have a wonderful week, Uh, especially if you live in Rochdale. I'm so sorry. Just because of the by-election, not because Rochdale's lovely. We love Rochdale. We love Rochdale. Man, I should have made that clearer. Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musti Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by Dan Hodgson and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineers David Dagahi, Charlotte Landes and Claudia Sheng. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts.